So we've been talking about our innate immune system. When you think of innate immunity, think about think uh, non-specific. Doesn't matter what the pathogen is, and think always on. It it doesn't need to be ramped up or activated for the most part. It is there and constantly protecting. In the earlier videos, we looked at our first lines of defense: skin, mucous membranes, and normal flora. What we're going to do uh, now is start looking at our second lines of defense. And in this video specifically, we're looking at phagocytosis. Now, I'm going to be looking primarily at phagocytic white blood cells, but understand that the process is quite similar in the phagocytic dendritic cells that we talked about earlier uh, that I hinted at a little when we were talking about um, some of the first lines of defense. So let's take a look at the process of phagocytosis. You should remember from anatomy and physiology uh, the formation of blood cells. Blood stem cells exist in the bone marrow, and they can be induced to begin developing as needed towards an erythroid stem cell, a myeloid stem cell, or a lymphoid stem cell. If they become an erythroid stem cell, they are committed at that point to uh, becoming an erythrocyte, a red blood cell. If they begin developing towards a lymphoid stem cell, then they are going to become B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Now those two white blood cells are really essential in the adaptive immune response. So we'll be coming back to those B cells and, and T cells in future videos. What we're concerned with here, though, are the myeloid stem cells, which can then be further differentiated, depending on the needs of, of the organism at the time, to form platelets, which are really uh, nucleus-free cell fragments involved in clotting and inflammation. They can form basophils that are essential for localized inflammation, <clears throat> or they can form uh, one of the phagocytic white blood cells, in particular neutrophils, monocytes, and eosinophils. The eosinophils seem to be most important in dealing with large parasites, things like worms or other big eukaryotes. Neutrophils and monocytes are the primary players in clearing viruses and bacteria. So for the majority of our infections, the neutrophils and the monocytes are really the heavy-duty workers. And we've got these crazy complex immune systems, but they all come down to how well the neutrophils and monocytes are working because these are the front-line soldiers, if you will. Now, a neutrophil is active as is and ready to fight in the battle. Um, monocytes need a further step in development to become macrophages, but they don't take that step until something induces them to become a macrophage. And uh, we'll talk about what those things can, can be that can induce a monocyte to finish its last stage of development and become an active phagocytic macrophage. So uh, what we're going to be talking about here uh, in this video is primarily neutrophils and monocytes. So let's look at the stages of phagocytosis. It begins with chemotaxis. Chemotaxis means uh, movement along a chemical gradient, either towards a chemoattractant or away from a, a chemorepellent. In this case, it's towards a chemoattractant. Our, our white blood cells, our neutrophils and macrophages, move by amoeboid movement. If you're not sure what that looks like, Go Google it and find a little video clip or, or something along those lines to see what amoeboid movement looks like. Um, so we get amoeboid movement, literally crawling of these white blood cells towards invading microorganisms. What do you think the attractants would be? If we were in class together right now, I'd pause what we were doing and I'd say, pair up with somebody and come up with a list of what you think would be the most likely attractants, chemotactic attractants, uh, to draw in these phagocytic white blood cells to the site of an infection. So pause the video and make a list. Actually take the time to go through this process. Okay, hopefully you came up with some possible chemotractants. I'll show you my short list here. <clears throat> Microbial molecules, things like LPS, peptidoglycan, uh, maybe some capsular polysaccharides, things that don't belong that are likely to be in a high concentration at the site of an infection and lower and lower concentration as you move away, thus creating a gradient. Right? And chemotaxis is going to require a gradient. And so it will move towards a higher concentration of these particular molecules. Leukocytes, white blood cells, and their components. Um, the components, what I mean by that is um, white blood cells have a certain lifespan to them. And when they enter into the battle, uh, after a few rounds of phagocytosis, they end up uh, dying and lysing. And there's fragments and bits and pieces of their guts everywhere. In fact, if you if you get a wound that's infected and you start seeing pus 
a, a lot of what you're seeing are the leukocytes and components. As that diffuses out and away from the site of the infection, that creates a gradient that allows fresh new phagocytic white blood cells to chemotax towards the, the, local, uh, the local infection. Damaged tissue cells, same thing. Um, you get an infection that's damaging tissue cells and their fragments in pieces create a gradient uh, that allows for chemotaxis. And then finally, some chemicals, complement, defensins, and chemokines. You know what defensins are. Um, complement, I've just hinted at. Complement is a set of, of liver proteins that will non-specifically uh, stick to the surface of, of pathogens, primarily bacterial pathogens. We'll talk a little about complement on and off as we go along. But where complement has accumulated, that means that you've got uh, an infection. Same with some defensins being released at the site of an infection. And then chemokines. Chemokines are simply um, chemical, uh, chemical signaling molecules that are involved in the immune response that allow for chemotaxis. <clears throat> They're part of a larger category we call cytokines. Cytokines are simply immune system signaling chemicals. Chemokines are specific cytokines that act as chemoattractants. So white blood cells that are in the battle are going to be secreting chemokine, chemokines to draw in more white blood cells. Some of your, um, uh, your normal uh, cells at that location can secrete chemokines, and that will draw in more white blood cells. So you can see chemotaxis is going to be very important because they can't see, and they don't have a map. There's no GPS here. They've got to follow chemical gradients to get to the location, and these are the kinds of things they're going to be sniffing out as they work their way towards the site of the infection. Now adherence should come as no surprise to you is the next step. Uh, you've got to get specific attachment of the phagocyte plasma membrane to the surface of the invading particles. So in my, um, in my PowerPoint sketch here, the big potato looking thing is supposed to be a phagocytic white blood cell. Um, relatively speaking, it should be a whole lot larger than a bacterium, but I just drew them out of proportion a little bit here. And you're gonna, they're gonna stick to the surface. Without sticking to the surface, they can't engulf them and digest them. And so they've got to not only get to the site of the infection by chemotaxis, they actually have to physically touch the pathogen and stick to the surface. How do they know what they're sticking to is pathogens? They don't have eyeballs. Nobody's got ID or passports, right? There's nothing. There's nobody's wearing a, a name tag. So what do they use? <clears throat> on the surface of the phagocyte are receptor molecules. Receptors are proteins on the surface that recognize patterns of something elsewhere. We call these toll-like receptors, or TLRs. Toll-like receptors in the phagocyte recognize patterns, molecular patterns, on the pathogen. We call those pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs. These are going to be patterns that are um, commonly found on the surface of pathogens or of microbes in general that are not commonly found in any molecule that would be self, that would be on the surface of your cell. So at this low level, there's a distinction between self and non-self taking place. This could be things like um, maybe uh, um, amino acid sequences in fimbriae proteins or flagellar proteins. They could be sugar sequences in capsular polysaccharides. Those are just some examples or possibilities of pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Um, think about viruses, right? Capsid proteins. They're pretty darn different from any other protein that's in you and me. And therefore, we have toll-like receptors to recognize some of those protein patterns in viral capsids. This is an essential piece to distinguishing self from non-self. And remember, we're still talking innate immunity. Inborn, always turned on, always active, always searching and protecting. And we would like to say non-specific. So here, this, this, the toll-like receptors are not distinguishing between a cold virus and a flu virus. They're simply finding PAMPs on the surface and saying, you don't belong here, I'm going to eat you. They don't distinguish between Pseudomonas and uh, E. coli. They simply say, you don't belong here based on these, these PAMPs, and we're going to consume you and eat you. So still relatively non-specific. When we see the adaptive immune response in later videos, you'll see just how specific that becomes. Now, adherence <clears throat> can be enhanced by something we call opsonization. Now, opsonization takes place primarily by the adaptive response.
there are two types of molecules that can stick to the surface of pathogens and flag them for destruction by phagocytes. Complement, a set of, of proteins from the liver, can non-specifically, similar to toll-like receptors non-specifically finding PAMPs, complement can non-specifically bind to uh, non-self particles and aid in opsonization, and then antibodies. Antibodies we're going to see are produced only in the adaptive response and only by uh, B lymphocytes, and they are highly, highly specific. So when we think about opsonization, we're not thinking innate immunity anymore. We're thinking adaptive. But I wanted to point this out here so that you understand that what really happens in the adaptive response is to enhance and improve and increase the rate and effectiveness of phagocytosis more than anything else. There are other pieces to it, but more than anything else, that's what's going on. So you're going to see that the adaptive response is feeding back into the innate response. And here's one of the key places. It's in this adherence step that can dramatically increase binding between a phagocyte and an invading particle. Ingestion. So the particle gets engulfed by pseudopodia. These are extensions of the cytoplasmic membrane. Forms a vesicle called a phagosome. Now this alone does not kill the pathogen because the fluid surrounding the microbe is just the same as the extracellular fluid. It instead has to fuse with a lysosome. The lysosome, if you don't remember what a lysosome is, go back and review that. It's a, an important structure in many, um, many eukaryotic cells. Forms a phagolysosome. This contains hydrolytic enzymes, things like proteases and nucleases, that'll chew up macromolecules. And it also uh, creates, at the time of fusion, reactive oxygen species, things like, like hydrogen peroxide and superoxide. These are oxygen molecules, oxygen-based molecules that are highly reactive that will randomly just start breaking apart carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. We call this step the oxidative burst. This is the killing phase where what was once a pathogen is now just a bunch of bits and fragments and chunks and pieces of that original pathogen. The final stage is elimination or exocytosis. This is when the phagolysosome, which is really a vesicle where the boundary is made of a phospholipid bilayer, just like the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, where the, the, the vesicle's membrane can fuse with the cell's membrane, and all the interior contents get released to the exterior space. Okay, the opposite of endocytosis that took place when we were exocytosing. Now again, <clears throat> just a little uh, foreshadowing of the adaptive immune response. It turns out that elimination isn't always step five. In some cases, a phagocytic white blood cell, and dendritic cells will do this too, will skip elimination. Why would they do that? Why would they keep a phagolysosome around with all its bits and fragments? What would they do with all those pieces if not barf them up into the environment around them? As you're reading and studying the adaptive response, see if you can answer that question. What can happen at, in, during phagocytosis instead of elimination that it turns out is actually essential to induce the adaptive immune response. We'll come back to that in a later video.